I will be talking in English. Before I start, let me just say that I apologize. Um, as you hear, I'm still a bit sick, uh, sick, but I think my voice will hold. The only thing is I have been sick the whole week, so, and this week was reserved to this paper. So I was kind of thinking of um, not coming at all, but then I decided I'd rather present some puzzle stones of my work and uh, give it for discussion. But please keep in mind, it is not a complete and fully fledged uh, a paper yet. The other forward is that what I'm presenting is an extension of some work that I have been doing with Christa Schlager since quite some time. Christa is here as well. She is also an Austrian feminist economist. And what we did is we worked since quite some time from a feminist perspective on economic governance. And so we, or I decided to put that a bit further in the context of a feminist Marxist perspective. And uh, yes, um, so that's the starting point. The starting point is the very dynamics of changed uh, power relations and changed economic policy dynamics within the narrow scope of economic governance. And then what I want to do here is put it in a larger frame of political economy perspectives. So um, what I will do today is <coughs> first give a preview on the economic governance in the EU and on its role in constitutionalizing austerity, then try to build in some feminist Marxist perspectives on the current dynamics, and based on that, uh, provide some suggestions for perspectives uh, for European struggles against exploitation and oppression in this frame of the economic policy making and setting out a, let's say, landscape of different elements on which there is a need to um, take forward the feminist struggles. So, um, as regards the EU, <coughs> the transformations taking place in the context of the EU economic governance, I think there's not so much need to talk a lot about this because all of you might uh, know about it. It's actually a, um, what I consider it is a key and very fundamental transformation, even though it seems to be along the lines of previous work of neoliberalism. But it put it again to a very different level, especially in terms of constitutionalizing it, building it into legal uh, rules and, yes. <laughs> Um, of course, it has this lopsided focus on deficit and debt uh, reduction and the clear um, focus of policies on dismantling of the welfare state, structural reforms as they are called, especially uh, um, an attempt and assault on, on labor as a whole on labor as a class in terms of dismantling labor rights and putting pressure on wages, etc. And, but it also means a transformation of institutions and processes that are, um, that are doing policies and it's a process of isolating uh, economic policy making from democratic institutions. Let me put, having said that just very generally, let me put it in a more, um, uh, in a broader picture, seeing the EU as a key battleground of a capitalist masculine stronghold. And here it is, the elite classes, the capitalist classes, currently gaining a lot of ground in this struggle, especially with the economic governance. So the background, and this has already been talked about, is the rise of neoliberalism as a political project, 
not really an economic project, but a political project of changing power relations. And, and, and this leading to change capital structures with the rise of finance capital and transnational corporate power with, uh, with embedded um, um, as a, what I call hotbed of unleashed masculine domina masculinistic domination built in this rise of uh, finance uh, capital and uh, transnational capital. And coming with this change of capital structures is changed capital interests of global financial and transnational co uh, corporate capital. And this, I think, is a, an important explanation of why these changes are taking place. Because as uh, welfare state developments had, were in some interest of national capital, as for transnational capital, this is no longer class compromises are no longer serving their interests because we, have, we are confronted with uh, global workers which are not embedded in particular locations. This, of course, holds true particularly for finance capital, but also for transnational uh, um, corporations. And it is to the contrary in the interest of these fractions of capital to undermine collective provisioning of social reproduction, and by this way, reinforcing the, uh, the possibilities for oppression and exploitation of the labor force. <clears throat> and against this background, economic governance um, restructuring within the EU can be seen as a project to reorganize power structures, strengthen power of masculine economic elites, and improve conditions for profit-making and capital accumulation. So, what we see in this um, EU economic governance and this battleground of um, capitalist masculine stronghold, what we see is there are several categories of weaponry being used. One is the seemingly not very, um, yeah, strong, but still not very important, but still the uh, economic policy objectives and rules. The key feature of these is constitutionalizing permanent austerity. And by this, this is a key in the struggle and a main series of weapons this, that comes with, because it has a lot to do with what I will be talking later about transformation of the state. Built in this austerity, permanent austerity, is the dismantling of uh, social provisioning within the welfare state. And of course, on each of these different categories of weaponry, there is a lot of gender relations, impacts on gender relations. So of course economic policy objectives and rules have built in gender biases and they are changing norms of social reproduction. I will come back to that. It's a manufacturing of ideologies. It's a preparing the ground and uh, providing common ideologies of Telt tightening, um, belt tightening. Sorry, telt tightening as the uh, belt tightening as the norm, self-evident. The the cutting of expenditure as almost uh, not only self-evident, but but building norms towards that's for the good. No, as almost personalizing the cutting down of the state and economic efficiency. So there is a lot in um, these building these ideologies of overspending of, of course, unproductive public social sector. 
that has a lot to do of, uh, with the transformation and with the public acceptance of transformations, of course, with a strong gender perspective in it. So, and then we have, so that was on the side of economic policy objectives and rules. Another main weaponry is the institutions of economic governance, where we see an isolating of decision-making on economic policies from democratic spaces, with all that comes with it from a gender perspective, masculine bureaucracy on the rise, intransparent processes, increased influence of capital interests in these processes, and participatory spaces, which are squeezed and reduced. <coughs> And as I have said before, another key element of, on this battleground is the transformation of the state, the attack on the welfare state, the reduction of public services, the economically sen meaningly senseless privatization of public um, property, which is, from an economic standpoint, complete nonsense. Still, there has been built a lot of ideology of support for that. Reducing expectations of the role of provisioning. So it's a transformation of the state coming with an attack on gender norms and gender relations. Individualization of provision of care. Financialization of care services, but also financialization of nature to a much larger de degree. From a women's employment perspective, this loss of relatively better employment opportunities and all that comes. And you said before that elites have not really answers to what's happening. I would really stress the point elites have good answers. It's not answers that make economic sense. Most of the time it doesn't, as we see. But they have answers that make a lot of sense in this political project of the class <laughs> struggle and rebuilding power relations to the benefit of um, finance capital and transnational capital. And we see that very well in this transformation within the frame of the economic governance. I will go uh, very fast over the others, weakening labor rights. Um, I have um, talked about that as a weakening of the, la the class, uh, working class as such, and increasing potentials for exploitation with a lot of um, gender dimensions, unprotected exploitations in the care sector that come with that. We have talked about um, temporary migration uh, even being legalized as a form of massive exploitation to replace non-public provision of um, certain care services. And all this having negative impacts on social reproduction and living conditions specifically for women, increasing vulnerability, increasing the reserve army as such, and a basis, again I repeat, for strengthening modes of exploitation. So, and of course with the um, built-in gender dimensions of putting a lot of um, work, care work to the, and um, yeah, uh, work to the domestic sector, etc. So to, <coughs> to summarize, when we want to look at it from, um, um, from a macro perspective, to looking at the key elements in macroeconomic policies, and this you could say is in a sense, um, bringing Frigga Haug's four in one perspective, which could be interpreted as being on the individual level, to bring it to a meson, to especially a macro level. And um, here I want to summarize on what's happening now, and then I will come to where the, the entry points for feminist struggles and what perspectives there should be taken. 
So we have this vicious cycle of masculine capitalist reconfigurations, reconfigurations especially uh, starting from within the EU as one of these key battlegrounds. I have talked about it. One element is this permanent, ideolo uh, permanent austerity and fabricating ideology. And here one could go back to Marx, uh, what he is telling us about the three dimensions of producing ideology. I'm not going into that, but it's very interesting to see that that's what's happening here. So his insights are very helpful. And then we have this element of <coughs> isolating economic policy decision-making from democratic institutions. So it's a dismantling of core democratic um, um, institutions, attack on the welfare state coming with this attack on gender norms and relations. And the fourth element is, oh, I have not been, sorry. I'm talking because I have it in front of me and <laughs> it's so nice here. That's all I talked about. It's so difficult for you to follow. Nobody told me. I'm very sorry. So that was what I talked before, the weaponry, the four dimensions, and the fifth one, the negative impact. I'm, I think that's, it was quite clear. Okay, I'm happy if it was clear. And now I'm at this picture. And that's what I mean by the vicious circle of the masculine capitalist reconfiguration. And you see here the different elements that go well together, and I have mentioned them before. And this leads to this strengthening of oppressive power relations along class, gender, citizenship, ethnicity, etc. And based on that stock taking of the status, what I want to come now, and this is already the last, <coughs> as I don't have too much time anymore. Is this what I want? Yes, now you see it. That's the final one, but the more important is in order to create a dynamics for feminist emancipatory revolutionary transformation, which definitely needs to be beyond EU, so, but I'm not too much talking about that, is create, it's uh, creating new dynamics towards emancipatory care-based social and economic relations. So on these four fronts where we have seen the capitalist weaponry, we suggest, I suggest to take a different um, strand on it. So one is this ensuring the, a strong basis for the public and for the public as a public sector, as public provisioning. And that means it calls for a lot of engagement in feminist struggles on the ideological level as key. Building ideas and constructing, in a sense, ideologies of care at the center of the economy. I stress that because usually we as economists don't uh, talk so much about the level of ideas, but I think this is something we can learn from the long tradition of feminist Marxists to, to really focus on that as well. And then another of these wheels where we need to invent is the question of reimagining and reinventing democratic institutions for participatory change. I'm not saying going back to the representative democracy, which is weakened now. That's far, far, far too little. It needs to go far beyond reflecting on what means building democratic processes at all levels of governance, <laughs> the local up to the macro level. And then, of course, reclaiming the public. And this, as we know from a feminist Marxist tradition, cannot go without change property relations. So it's um, fighting for uh, commons, cooperatives, um, different organization of social uh, property. And at the core, and this comes a bit almost as an answer, or one of the answers to the discussions before, 
if we want to get, go beyond these oppressions and find emancipatory transformatory ways, we need to focus on building, moving towards a cooperation and care-based economy, which is bringing together the product, so-called productive and reproductive sector. So we need to think and imagine economy as a place coming together, production of life and production of goods and services necessary for life for well-being. So this is um, one, at least our answer to, to where to go about. There is no way going beyond oppressive, exploitive capitalist relations without bringing this together. And we've, with this different element, we are at the macro level and then coming down to the micro level, we envisage this emancipatory reconstruction of power relation to overcome the current processes uh, of dominance. Thank you very much. <clears throat>